I'd like to call your attention to a couple of verses of Scripture that uh, are kind of the basis for what I want to deal with today. Uh, Paul, writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4, says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled or deceived Eve through his craftiness, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive another spirit which you have not received, another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. I believe that in this area we're living in a culture where that is happening. Um, the people that dominate the area use biblical terms and so forth, but they have a different definition because they've got a different dictionary. And so I think we need to be aware and then to do something about it. Paul says in these verses, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, so you might be uh, deceived yourself, turned away from the simplicity that's in Christ. The gospel is very simple in Christ. Those of us who live in this area know that the official name of the Mormon church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They pray in the name of Jesus Christ. They testify in the name of Jesus Christ. You'll find many books on the shelves with the, the title, and in the title is the name Jesus Christ. And many of the leaders have claimed Mormons are Christians. Among them are uh, Apostle Bruce R. McConkie, for example, and he says Mormons are true Christians. Their worship is the pure, unadulterated Christianity authored by Christ and accepted by Peter, James, and John and all the ancient saints. That's in Mormon Doctrine, page 513. And on the same page, he says Mormonism is Christianity. Christianity is Mormonism. They are one and the same, and they are not to be distinguished from each other in the minutest detail. Now, if you can see beyond what he's saying, he is saying that Mormonism is the only true Christianity. Now, he says also in a little pamphlet called What the Mormons Think of Christ on page 2, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known informally by the nickname Mormons, believe the Bible. Indeed, so literally and completely do their beliefs and practices conform to the teachings of the Bible that it is not uncommon to hear informed persons say, if all men believed the Bible, all would be Mormons. Bible doctrine is Mormon doctrine. Mormon doctrine is Bible doctrine. They are one and the same. Well, I don't know. I've lived around Mormons all my life, and I have never heard anybody say, if everybody believed the Bible, they'd all be Mormons. Have any of you ever heard that statement? McConkie says it's not uncommon. <laughs> but did you notice what he also said? They believe the Bible so implicitly, so fully, that Bible doctrine is Mormon doctrine and Mormon doctrine is Bible doctrine. If that's true, I have a question. Why do they need four other sources? Yes, four. The Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the most important of all, a living prophet. If they believe the Bible, why do they need those other four sources? Do they teach the same thing as the Bible? If so, they really don't need them. But if they teach anything else, they fall under the condemnation of what Paul mentions in Galatians 1, 8, and 9, when he says, but though we, we apostles, or an angel from heaven, if he preaches any other gospel unto you than that which we have already preached to you, let him be accursed. Yeah. Amen. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preaches any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So, I ask the question, why do they need four other sources to know God's word and God's will? If Bible doctrine is Mormon doctrine, Mormon doctrine is Bible doctrine. I have another question. If what he said is true, why does the Mormon church today have approximately 85,000 missionaries who go primarily to who? 
Christians. If Mormonism is Christianity and Christianity is Mormonism, why are they doing that? Well, it's obvious there is a huge difference. And they know it. And we ought to know it. And we ought to be doing something about it. Now, Jesus addressed some of those issues in Matthew chapter 7. He said in verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They'll look like the flock. He goes on to say down there in verses 21 and 2, Many, not few, but many, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name uh, cast out devils or demons and in thy name done many wondrous or miraculous works? Sounds like they should be patted on the back by the Lord. But what does that next verse say? Jesus said, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. What is iniquity? Wickedness. What were they claiming they were doing? They were prophesying in his name, casting out devils in his name, doing miraculous works in his name. But he says, get out of here. I don't even know you, you workers of iniquity. Well, we have been forewarned by the Lord himself, and of course there are many other warnings throughout Scripture about the counterfeits, about the pretenders. And we need to be on guard and understand that just because somebody uses the name Jesus Christ doesn't mean they believe what the Bible teaches. And too many people seem to be readily fooled. I want to talk about some very basic things. I'm going to talk just about four basic things uh, Bible doctrines, if we can put it that way, uh, that uh, we differ on. And one is so basic, the doctrine of God. Some years ago, I was helping to plant a little church. We moved to a new community here in Utah. And, and before we even got unpacked, there was a knock at my door. And as soon as I opened the door, I realized that these were uh, a couple of stake missionaries, they were middle-aged men. They said, we're your neighbors, and uh, we have a message that we believe is so important, we want to share it with you. And I said, well, come on in. And as they were getting seated, one of them said, well, we'd like to offer a word of prayer before we begin. And I said, well, we believe in prayer, but before you pray, I'd like to know who you're going to pray to. And... Um, they said, well, God, of course, I said, a Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, anybody would say that. What I want to know is, what God are you going to pray to? What do you mean? I said, is he a resurrected, glorified man with a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, yours and mine? And one of them said kind of meekly, well, yeah, I guess so. And I said, well, you're in my home now, and that's not the God we pray to. We got into a good discussion about God, and then one of them said to me, why, we don't believe in the same God, do we? I said, you know, that's the same conclusion I came to. <laughs> and uh, so let's not pretend that we believe in the same God. When we know better, we know we don't believe in the same God. Now, I know the first article of faith says we believe in God, the eternal Father, and in the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. That sounds good. Many evangelicals have said to me, I don't see anything wrong with that. Well, there's nothing wrong with the words. But you notice it doesn't say these three are one God because they don't believe that. Joseph Smith said on page 370 of teaching of the prophet Joseph Smith that the Father is one person, the uh, Son is another person, the Holy Ghost is another person, and these three persons are three gods. He also said, in teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith on page 345, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. He went on to say, I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. What did that first article of faith say? We believe in God, the eternal Father. 
What did Joseph Smith say? We've imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I'll refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. You hear a little bit of dissonance in that? I do. Well, um, Brigham Young said in the teachings of the, pre the presidents of the church, Brigham Young on page uh, 29, God the Father was once a man on another planet. He's one of those extraterrestrial guys. And uh, anyway, uh, he's, a, he's a resurrected, glorified man now. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, section 130, verse 22, says the Father, God the Father, has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man. So that's Mormon scripture, by the way. And that's why I talk to those stake missionaries about their view of God. And uh, Lorenzo Snow, and uh, he was the fifth prophet, and last year they were still studying the teachings of the presence of the church, Lorenzo Snow. On uh, page 83 of that manual, it has that little couplet that he formed based on Joseph Smith's um, King Follett discourse, and this is where Lorenzo Snow says, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may be, or man may become. It was still in the manual that they were studying last year. Now, I've had uh, some who claim to be evangelical say, well, that's something that Mormons believed in the past, but they don't anymore. Well, if they don't believe it, why are they putting it in their manuals? Uh, those manuals, by the way, are for the LDS priesthood and the Relief Society, which includes virtually all active Mormon adults, and they were studying it just last year. Well, one of the questions that I've raised with uh, Mormons as I've talked with them is, when God was a man, did he worship a god? Well, Joseph Smith answered that, of course. Pages 370 to 73, more than once he says, um, if Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and John the Apostle uh, discovered that God, the Father of Jesus Christ, had a father. You may suppose that he had a father also. You understand what Smith was saying? Here's Jesus Christ who has God the Father, and God the Father has a father who has a father, and that goes on back endlessly. I've had some interesting discussions with uh, uh, teachers of the Institutes of Religion and Mormon seminaries and so forth, and they talk about this eternal round where gods beget gods. Orson Pratt, you know, was one of the original 12 apostles, and he was uh, one of their great theologians. On page 345 of the Journal of Discourses, volume 2, he says, if we take a million worlds like this and number the particles of matter in those worlds, we should find that there are more gods than there are particles of matter in those worlds. I don't know about you, but that boggles my mind. That's a lot of gods. <laughs> but what, what was it that Mokanaki said? Bible doctrine is Mormon doctrine. Mormon doctrine is Bible doctrine. Is that what the Bible teaches? You know, even the Pearl of Great Price, uh, Abraham uh, chapters 4 and 5, or section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, talks about the plurality of gods. But does the Bible, what did God say about himself? Isaiah 43, 10. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Isaiah 44, verse 8. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Was he telling the truth? Does God lie? Or is he stupid? Or did he mean what he said? I think he did. There is no other God. He says in Hosea 11, 9, I am God and not man. Psalm 90, verse 2 says, From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. That's the God of the Bible. Very different from what Mormonism uh, teaches about God. In John 4, 24, we read that um, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit is invisible, you know. That's why John 1.18 and 1 John 4.12 says, No man has seen God at any time. 
No man, I don't care who he is, has seen God at any time. Why? Because as Colossians 1.15 and 1 Timothy 1.17 both say, God is invisible. What does invisible mean? Can't be seen. So if you say, I can see what, I can't, be, what can't be seen, that's a contradiction. But that's what Joseph Smith said. Well, let me move on to Jesus Christ. Uh, your view of God is going to affect Jesus Christ, and it does for Mormons. <coughs> um, a Christian fellow brought uh, a Mormon to me one time, and <coughs> he said, um, <coughs> my Mormon friend believes in Jesus Christ as a Savior. And uh, he said, uh, uh, he wonders why we can't embrace him as a fellow Christian. And uh, <clears throat> he said, belief in Christ is the bottom line after all, isn't it? And I said, well, not quite. And um, he said, what do you mean? And I asked the Mormon if he would mind answering some questions for me. <clears throat> he said, no. So I asked him, is the Jesus that you believe in the literal son of a father and mother God? in the premortal spirit world? And he said, yeah. I said, is he the spirit brother of Lucifer as well as all the rest of us in that premortal spirit world? He said, yeah. I said, did he become a god by keeping the same laws and ordinances of the gospel by which you can become a god? And again, he said, yeah. And I thanked him for his honesty, but I said, uh, I have to be honest with you. The Jesus you have just described cannot be found in the Bible, and it's the Jesus of the Bible who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. <clears throat> well, he tried to protest and, and tell me that there was only one Jesus. I reminded him of the passage we began with here in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. If somebody comes preaching another Jesus, a different kind of Jesus, Paul said, I'm afraid you'll go along with them. You won't know the difference. And I said, that's the problem. Now, Bruce McConkie says, all men, Christ included, were born as God's children in the preexistence of the premortal spirit world, Mormon Doctrine, page 278. And the LDS First Presidency said, all men and women are in the similitude of the universal father and mother and are literally the sons and daughters of deity. That statement has been reproduced I don't know how many times in how many books. You can find it many places. It's in Mormon Doctrine, page 84. Actually, it's in there several times. McConkie also said, by obedience and devotion to the truth, Christ attained that pinnacle of intelligence which ranked him as a god, as the Lord omnipotent, while he was yet in his premortal state, or the preexistence. Page 129 of Mormon Doctrine. Well, <clears throat> um, he didn't explain how come God the Father had to go through eternal progression <clears throat> uh, from the uh, realm of pure intelligence to premortal spirit to mortality to being resurrected, and then through the eons of eternity, he evolves into a god. But Jesus became a god before he ever got his body. And he doesn't explain why the Holy Ghost is called a god He's never had a body. So there are some problems with their concept of eternal progression towards godhood. Um, <clears throat> McConkie also says, God the Father is a perfected, glorified, holy man, an immortal personage, and Christ was born of the world as the literal, literal son of this holy being. He was born in the same personal, real, and literal sense that any mortal son is born to a mortal father. There's nothing figurative about his paternity. He was begotten, conceived, and born in the normal, natural course of events, for he is the Son of God, and that designation means what it says. That's page 742 in Mormon Doctrine. He said on page 471 uh, concerning Mary, the mother of Jesus, that Mary, like Christ, was chosen and foreordained in preexistence, or the, the premortal spirit world, for the part she was destined to play in the great plan of salvation. She was one of the noblest and greatest of all the spirit offspring of the Father. When she was born on earth, she was a virgin, most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. As such a virgin, she gave birth to a son whose father was the almighty God. Did you follow that? 
God the Father fathered her in the pre-mortal world as a baby spirit, and then he fathered her son here in this world. In Mormonism, Christ was not conceived by the Holy Spirit, as Matthew 1.20 and Luke 1.35 says, but by a resurrected, glorified man. Well, the biblical view of Christ is very different from that. Christ never became a god. He's always been God, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W-O-R-D, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Hebrews 1.8, the Scripture says, Unto the Son, He, God the Father, says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. When doubting Thomas saw the risen Christ, what did he say? My Lord and my God. What did Paul say about Christ in 1 Timothy 3.16? Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Not a God, but God. That's why the Christ of the Bible is able to save us to the uttermost. It's because of who he is. Well, when it comes to scriptural authority, again, we have some differences. I was substituting at uh, a Protestant uh, Bible Academy, which is like a Mormon seminary, uh, one time, and uh, uh, we came to the end of the day, the final bell rang, and uh, I was getting ready to leave when the door to my classroom flew open, and in came eight Mormon seminary teachers. And they said, what's this we hear about you? Being a former Mormon, you're over here teaching that the Bible is a sufficient guide to, to know God and to know uh, salvation and so forth. And I said, well, that's true. And uh, this one uh, teacher said, well, uh, surely you as a former Mormon know that the Bible is incomplete. I said, what do you mean incomplete? Are you talking about those so-called 20 lost books of the Bible that several Mormon writers write about? Well, Yes. And I just said, well, uh, you're, you're talking about the book of the wars of the Lord, the book of uh, Jasher, the book of Adu the prophet, and on and on. Yeah, yeah. I said, well, do you have them? That's what I heard. Silence. Absolute silence. I said, well, are they in the Book of Mormon? And then I was shocked. Half of those guys were looking at the table of contents to see. I, I said... There's only 15 books in the whole Book of Mormon. You can't have 20 lost books in there. I said, are they in the uh, Doctrine and Covenants? Well, they knew better than that. They, those are revelations to Joseph Smith primarily. And, and uh, I said, well, how, what about the Pearl of Great Price? No, that's just Moses, Abraham, and the two little books of Joseph Smith. And uh, so I said, well, they're not in any of your standard works then. No. Well, I said, how about Joseph Smith's inspired version of the Bible? Are they in there? Silence again. I said, well, how many books are in the Bible you teach over at seminary? One of them said, 66. I said, good. That's a number that we have in, in our Bible. I said, but I happen to have a copy of Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible here today. I'd like you to take a look at the table of contents and tell me how many books are there. 65. He lost another book. <laughs> I said, you're in worse condition than what you say we are. <laughs> well, at any rate, <clears throat> Mormons try to downplay the Bible. You know, the eighth article of faith. We believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it's translated correctly. They, they really mean more than translated. They mean transmitted because it not only involves translation, but uh, those old priests put in what they wanted to and took out what they didn't want and so forth. And, and so most of them have the impression that the Bible is just, uh, it's just uh, not as reliable it, as it needs to be. The other books, as McConkie says on page 764 in the uh, book Mormon Doctrine, the other books are to be accepted without reservation. But those of you who've done some study know that uh, all three of their extra-biblical books have been changed since they first came out. The only book that hasn't been changed, really, is the King James Bible, which is their official Bible yet. Uh, and yet they're saying the Bible is the one that has the problem. That doesn't compute in my brain either. But uh, at any rate, uh, the Bible is the least important. Then they have the Book of Mormon, which is uh, 
uh, the book that Joseph Smith translated from the gold plates that the angel Moroni told him about there in the hill Camorra, and he translated them by the gift and power of God, and when it was translated, he said, uh, the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth. It's the keystone of our religion. A man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. That sounds pretty good. The most correct of any book on earth. Well, it's been corrected over 4,000 times since then, but um, at any rate, uh, they believe that it's, a, it's an important book. And it is a very important book as far as their proselyting is concerned. But as far as their doctrine is concerned, it's almost worthless. It doesn't have Mormon doctrine. I've had a number of people say, should I read the Book of Mormon to understand Mormonism? And I tell them, you can read it to understand the Book of Mormon, but to understand Mormonism, no, it won't help because none of the unique doctrines of Mormonism are in the Book of Mormon. I found that out as a young Mormon myself when I was searching. I, I thought, you know, I'd heard so much about the Book of Mormon and how it would settle uh, any of the questions I had and so forth. I, I read it through, and I was more confused when I finished than when I began, because it didn't answer anything. Yeah. And at any rate, <clears throat> uh, the, the Book of Mormon is supposed to be a sacred history of the ancestors of the American Indians. But there is as much evidence to support the Book of Mormon as real history as there is for Mother Goose to be a real history of real people. You understand what I'm saying? There's not a scintilla of evidence to support the Book of Mormon. Not anything, not one name, event, place, or anything can be verified. You ever notice there's no maps in the Book of Mormon? You know why? They don't know where it is. And if they don't know where it is, how can they identify the cities and all the other things? So there's some real problems as far as the Book of Mormon is concerned. And even, as you probably heard, the DNA... Uh, of the American Indian is, is Asiatic, not Semite, like the Book of Mormon would have you believe. Well, then there's the Doctrine and Covenants, which uh, contains a lot of revelations that Smith said he received from God the Father. And in those revelations are numerous false prophecies. I could not believe when I started looking uh, critically at the Doctrine and Covenants how many false prophecies there are in there. Now, I don't have time to go into those today, but if you're interested, my website, Utah Christian Publications, you can just Google it, Utah Christian Publications. There's, I think there's 25 on there now. I've got twice that many when my webmaster gets time to, to put them on. But um, uh, there's a lot of false prophecy. And how many false prophecies does it take to make a man a false prophet? I think one's enough, according to Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5 and 18... Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verses 21 and 2. Um, uh, if a, a man prophesies in the name of God and it doesn't come to pass, he's a false prophet. If it comes to pass and he's preaching in the name of other gods, he's a false prophet, even if it comes to pass. And so Joseph Smith, I think, met the qualifications of a false prophet on both counts. Well, let me go on to the Pearl of Great Price. Uh, the fourth book of LDS Scripture, it contains Moses, which is, uh, uh, it's a corruption of Genesis, uh, the first part of Genesis. Actually, uh, the book of Moses is um, Genesis 1-1 through 8-18 of the uh, inspired version of the Bible by Joseph Smith. It's verbatim, word for word, exactly the same thing. The only thing that's different is the verse numbers, but it's exactly the same content. And it's supposed to be a revelation, so there's no original documents to go to to verify whether or not uh, it's a, a reliable translation. Well, uh, then the next book in the Pearl of Great Price is the book of Abraham, which I think is the most important of all the books of Mormon scripture for one reason. It's the only book where the original documents for that particular book exist. Uh, they were lost for a long time, but the papyri that Smith supposedly translated were found and turned over to the Mormon Church on November 27, 1967. I'd been studying that for some time, and I was elated when I saw on the front pages of the Deseret News these uh, photocopies of the papyri that they had found. And, and, of course, the Mormons were saying this would now prove that Joseph Smith was a, a reliable translator. Well, it proved just exactly the opposite. Um, 
I sent copies to Dr. Wilson at Chicago University, Dr. Parker at Brown University, who were reputable Egyptologists, and they both said it's common burial material. They uh, put those uh, papyri with the dead when they buried them during that particular period of time. And I can't find an Egyptologist anywhere on the face of the earth that will support Joseph Smith's translation. So what did Mormons do? They said there's a second level of translation. There's a spiritual level that only Joseph Smith could see. You know, that, <laughs> that stretches my uh, mind a little bit, but that's the way they try to get out of it. Well, um, then there's the two little books of Joseph Smith. There's the Joseph Smith Matthew, which is a corruption of Matthew 24, and the Joseph Smith history, which is supposed to be the story of how Mormonism began. The story that's in the uh, Pearl of Great Price, though, wasn't published till 1842, and Joseph Smith supposedly had his first vision in 1820. So there's 22 years there during which Smith told some other stories about the beginning of Mormonism. And we don't have time to go into those today, but uh, it does raise some questions about uh, the validity of this story that's there. And then, of course, there's the living prophet. Uh, that's the fourth source outside of the Bible that they have to know God's word and God's will. Now, uh, Thomas Monson is the 16th prophet. And one of the things that has interested me is, uh, as far as I can see, the last 10 prophets have prophesied nothing. Oh, they refer to some prophecies and so forth, but they haven't prophesied anything. And the first few prophets of the Mormon church did prophesy things that were yet future, most of which didn't come to pass. And I think that's the reason why the later prophets are not um, doing any predicting of the future. But uh, I've asked Mormons, uh, what has Thomas Monson ever prophesied? Well, what about Hinckley before him? What, what did he ever prophesy? And so on. And they, they tell me, well, a prophet doesn't always have to prophesy. And I say, I agree. He doesn't always have to, but surely sometime he ought to. <laughs> Otherwise, you might as well call him a dishwasher or whatever, you know, uh, if he's not going to really prophesy. But uh, they claim they're, they're led by a living prophet who doesn't prophesy. Well, um, by contrast, as Christians, we have the Bible, and we believe the Bible is sufficient for everything that we believe or practice. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The word of our God shall stand forever. You see, I believe in a God who not only cared enough about his people to reveal his word to them, but also to preserve that word. You know, in the New Testament, 1 Peter 1, 5, says that we as believers are kept by the power of God. If he can keep us, surely he can keep his word. Well, Peter echoed that uh, statement that uh, Isaiah 40, verse 8 uh, says, the word of our God shall stand forever. Peter says the word of the Lord uh, abides forever. Uh, it endures forever. First Peter 1, 23 and 25. In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Who said that? Jesus. What else did Jesus say? Matthew 28, 18. All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. If he has all power in heaven and earth, and he says, my word won't pass away, I believe we can accept that and believe it. Otherwise, we can't believe anything that he said. Well, um, the Bible is a real history of real people. The Hebrew people or the Jewish people still exist. Their language exists. The land is still there. And uh, there have been some other ancient documents that verify some of the things that are in the Bible. Not everything, but some of them. And archaeology has verified a number of the places and, and so forth that are mentioned in the Bible. Unlike the Book of Mormon, where absolutely nothing has ever been verified. Well, let me move on quickly to the gospel. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I've asked many times uh, returned Mormon missionaries in particular, if I have a terminal illness and I'm going to be gone in the next week or two, what would you tell me that I need to know so that I can have God's very best in eternity? And usually I get the Joseph Smith story. Sometimes I get... Uh, well, you need to be baptized by the authority of the Mormon priesthood and be confirmed as a member of the one true church, and you need to keep all the laws and ordinances of the gospel, 
And uh, this includes going to the temple and being sealed to your wife for all eternity and uh, just a whole host of things. And then endure to the end. And then uh, uh, you may be able to get to the very best that God has to offer. And uh, in t telling me these things, one of the things that I've pointed out to them, sometimes they don't even mention Christ. And uh, sometimes when they tell me the story of Joseph Smith and so forth, they mention him twice in the name of the church and that Joseph Smith saw him. But they, they kind of ignore the fact that the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It seems to me like if there's only one mediator, it's a pretty serious thing to ignore the only mediator between God and man. But let me just read you a little bit of... Uh, uh, what Mormonism says about the gospel. Um, this is from the teachings of the presence of the church, Brigham Young. And uh, <clears throat> on page 15, uh, it says, Our religion is nothing more nor less than the true order of heaven, the system of laws by which the gods and the angels are governed. The gospel of the Son of God that has been revealed is a plan or system of laws and ordinances by strict obedience to which the people who inhabit this earth are assured that they may return again into the presence of the Father and Son. God has instituted laws and ordinances for the government and benefit of the children of men to see if they would obey them and prove themselves worthy of eternal life. Um, then on page 18, Brigham goes on to say, uh, the gospel, which is defined by him as laws and ordinances and the priesthood, are the means that he, God, employs to save and exalt his obedient children. Laws and ordinances and priesthood is what saves and exalts us? Where's Jesus in all that? You know, Paul said in Galatians 2.21, if righteousness came by the law, then Christ died in vain. There's no purpose to his death. Why did he ever leave heaven's glory and come here and go all the way to Calvary? if laws and ordinances and priesthood could do the job. Well, <clears throat> uh, I met LeGrand Richards several years ago, and one of the things that interests me in his book, Marvelous Work and a Wonder, page 102, he says, Jesus Christ redeemed all from the fall. He paid the price. He offered himself a ransom. He atoned for Adam's sin, leaving us responsible for our own sins. Isn't that a thrilling message? We're responsible. We can't do anything to save ourselves. Well, <clears throat> you're familiar with the third article of faith. We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. That's how we're supposed to be saved. Is that what the Bible teaches? Remember what we started out with? Bible doctrine is Mormon doctrine. Mormon doctrine is Bible doctrine. They're one and the same. Are they? You answer that. I don't believe it. Well, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, the 10th prophet of the church, talks about two kinds of salvation. He says there's the general salvation, that which comes to all men, irrespective of a belief in this life in Christ. And then there's individual salvation, that which man merits through his own acts through life and by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. That's in Doctrine of Salvation, uh, volume 1, page uh, 134, and um, um, it seems to me <clears throat> that uh, uh, once again, Mormonism has used the word salvation in a totally different way. Neither one of the salvation that uh, Joseph Healing Smith mentions are biblical salvation. General salvation is just resurrection of the body. Jesus provides that for everybody. And then individual salvation, you have to merit it by your own acts through life and by obedience to laws and ordinances of the gospel. That's not biblical salvation. The biblical salvation I read about is uh, uh, spelled out, for example, in Romans 5 and verse 6. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Um, <clears throat> or in verse 8, Romans chapter 5, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, when we were dead in trespasses and sins, uh, he, he saved us because we couldn't save ourselves. We were incapable. 
I'm sure that many of you are familiar with that passage Mormon sometimes quote from the Book of Mormon, uh, 2 Nephi 25, 23. We know that it's by grace that we're saved. After all, we can do. Let me illustrate that. Supposing you see a car that uh, goes off of the road and uh, it uh, is by a big river and it plunges way out into the river and the guy is unconscious. What would you do? Would you go down and stand by the side of the river and uh, watch this unconscious guy as he, the car bobs up and down in the river and say, I'm going to save him as soon as he's done all he can do. That's the kind of grace that 2 Nephi 25, 23 is talking about. We are unable, we are incapable of saving ourselves. That's why we needed a Savior. That's why Christ came and died for our sins. And the gospel that the Bible talks about, spelled out there in 1 Corinthians 15, says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. What does he say it is? Christ died for our sins. Amen. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He was raised for our justification and he's now interceding on our behalf. That's the gospel message. Mormons desperately need to know that. You see, the greatest exchange ever made is spelled out for us there in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, Christ, to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took our sin, we get his righteousness. God imputes righteousness without works, Romans 4, verse 6. That's the message that gives us hope. Otherwise, if it's based on what we do, we haven't got a ghost of a chance. I thank God for an all-sufficient Savior. As, as Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by Him. Not by His church, not by His laws and ordinances, not by anything that we do, but by Him. Jesus Himself said in John 6.47, He that believes on me has everlasting life. That's the Savior I proclaim. I would say to any of you here today, if you're trusting in anything else, you're lost. You need the Christ of the Bible. He alone can save. He is the one and only mediator between God and men, as 1 Timothy 2.5 says. God bless you. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word, for the simplicity of the gospel. And Lord, I would pray that you would make each one of us better ambassadors for Jesus Christ through being at this conference. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name.